Let me ask you a question. What are these switches for? Or this button? Or these patch points? I mean, it's all labeled oscillator sync, so it's pretty clearly about syncing oscillators, but what does that mean? When would I want to do it? And why does my head hurt? Let's find out. Hi everyone, I'm Jeff. Welcome back to Sound & Voltage. On this channel, I cover topics around modular, synth technology, and unusual musical and sound design techniques. I don't monetize this channel, I don't take sponsors, so if you end up enjoying this video, consider hitting the like button and subscribing. It really helps the channel. On paper, oscillator sync is pretty simple. I'll let Wikipedia tell you. One oscillator, at the end of its cycle, resets another. Clear enough. And then you find diagrams like this and you think, cool, this is simple. Well, this video was supposed to be easy. I set out to make this video thinking, eh, it's going to be quick, a short video that I can get out the door fast before I move on to frequency modulation. Oh, how I long for those simpler days. Now, if I had read just a tiny bit further down the page on Wikipedia, I'd have seen where they quote Gordon Reed from Sound on Sound Design, saying that sync is one of the least understood elements of any synthesizer. And this guy knows what he's talking about. If you haven't seen his 63-part series on subtractive synthesis, you're missing out. I'll include a link in the description. If I had heeded Gordon's insight, I may have come into this with a more realistic view of what I was up against. But I didn't, so here we are. Now, to be fair, the implementation of oscillator sync in fixed architecture keyboards hides a lot of the complexity. It doesn't really matter how it works, because you can't tinker with it. You've got a button to press, and either you like that sound or you don't. By comparison, the options available with modular synths are a lot broader. That's just sort of the nature of modular. With great flexibility comes great confusion. And boy howdy did I go down a rabbit hole with this. Let's start with my naive interpretation of how sync worked, based on what uh, Wikipedia there said. In green, on the bottom, is the leading oscillator. That's the oscillator we're going to sync to. Above in blue is the following oscillator. That's the one that's going to be synced. You used to hear the terms master and slave oscillators, but these days I'm seeing leader and follower more commonly, and really they're more descriptive. These two oscillators are just doing their thing at their own speeds, which means they're at a different pitch. And now I'm going to turn on the sync. You can immediately see the difference. The follower just stops wherever it is when the leader waveform hits its downward edge. And then when the sync is turned off, it immediately goes back to how it was before. And there's really two things to notice in that example. First, the shape of the wave changed. It was a nice triangle and now it's this sawtoothy thing which is cut off abruptly. Second, the repeating waveform got shorter to match the frequency of the leading oscillator. So by syncing the follower against the leader, we've changed the pitch of the follower to match the leader, and we've changed the shape of the wave, which means we'll have changed the harmonic content, the timbre of the resulting sound. Actually, there's a third thing that's interesting. If we have two square waves, say, at the same pitch, but out of phase, then when the sync is enabled, the phase of the follower is now synced to that of the leader, which could avoid or cause problems, I imagine. I'm not gonna go much more into it, but it's interesting. While I think we can all agree that the animation was awesome, and it does match the sort of canonical description of how oscillator sync works. In the real world, I was never able to get it to actually work like that. So I guess that makes it a good time for a demo. First, I want to point out that the VCOs I'm using here are based around the Curtis 3340 analog oscillator chip. It and its modern replicas have been at the heart of both keyboard and modular synths for decades. That ubiquity is part of why I chose it, but it also has more detail about how it works than any other oscillator design I could find. I've got two modules here. One is the Nonlinear Circuit CEM3340. It's basically just a modular interface into the core functionality. And then I'm using the Depfer A1114, the uh, quad VCO, which packs four oscillators, each of which is based around its own 3340. I'm going to start here by using the pulse wave output from the uh, CEM3340 as my leading oscillator. I'm going to plug that into one of the Mordaxes. Mordaxes? Mordices? Anyway, you can see it here on the oscilloscope and you can hear it, and you can see that I've got it tuned to C3. For reasons I'll get to here in a minute, I'm gonna run it through an attenuverter. So you can see I can invert the waveform, going from 0 to minus 10 instead of the standard 0 to 10 volts. I'm using both of the Mord axes for this, and I'm routing all the inputs from one into the other so I can look at two things at the same time. Let's 
This should look familiar now. I've got the same setup as for my animation. The channel in green is the leading oscillator from the CEM3340 at a pitch of C3, and the other channel in blue is the following oscillator from the Depfer, and I have it tuned to F2. All that remains now is to plug the leading oscillator into the sync input on the following oscillator. And there you go. You can see it happen right there. The shape of the waveform changed, and along with it, the pitch. Now, weirdly, you can see that the pitch dropped down to C2. That doesn't quite match with what we were expecting, since the leading oscillator was tuned to C3, and that's where I expected it would show up. And there's a couple different ways to explain why this happens, but they're all a bit technical. Suffice to say that the sync doesn't really reset the following oscillator to zero each time, the way the animation suggested. I was simulating what happens if the follower just completely resets, but it doesn't. Here's a more accurate animation, so we can get a good look at what's happening. You can see that in order to make a complete cycle, it's actually stretching that wave out over two cycles, and then adding that little hitch in the middle. It took me forever to work out the math of why this happens, and if people really care, I could do a separate video on it. It's just the same idea of changing where the oscillator is in its cycle, just not as dramatically. But the same two things happened. The pitch of the follower changed from an F to a C, and you can see that the shape of the waveform has changed, which is going to change the timbre of the output sound. I've made a separate video before that describes the harmonic content of different waveforms, and we can see the traditional sawtooth breakdown here, with the strong fundamental and the harmonics dropping off geometrically from there. Now let's check out the modified waveform. Once we sync the oscillators, it adds in a new undertone, a subharmonic, so strong that the tuner, and our ears, perceive it as the primary component of the sound. But it did that by syncing against a faster oscillator. Neat. And look at the pattern of the harmonics here. In a sawtooth, the second harmonic should be half the power of the first, the third should be the third of the power, the fourth harmonic should be a quarter of the power. They should be getting progressively smaller. But here we see them sort of bouncing up and down alternately. In fact, it kind of looks like two different sawtooth waves interleaved with each other. Double neat. Earlier I said that I was running the leading oscillator through an attenuverter, and that's because the pulse wave from the CEM3340 is unipolar, it's always a positive pulse, and I wanted to see what happens when we send in a negative pulse. And check that out, we get a completely different resulting waveform. This time we do get that tight sync against the leader's pitch, but when we look at the spectrum, it's been really stripped down compared to when we have the positive pulse plugged in. Where before it seemed like we had two spectra added together, this one seems to have harmonics removed. Up until now, I've been using a follower oscillator that is pitched lower than the leader. Now I'm going to bump up the follower by an octave. Now it's F3 versus the leader at C3. When I give it the positive pulse, it looks about the same. But when I turn that into a negative pulse, check that out. Now the resulting waveform looks like this weird pulse followed by a sawtooth. And when we check out the harmonics, they're all over the place. They each generate really different sounds caused by really different harmonic content, but it's all coming from just syncing basically the same sawtooth with the same pulse wave. And actually, we've only looked at sawtooth waves. Let's see what happens when we try a triangle wave for the follower. That's a pretty neat change to the waveform. And we can see that it's added these little mini triangles in order to spread the waveform out over two cycles. Triangle waves are fairly low on harmonics, but this has added a few in. Okay, let's recap a bit here. We know that syncing oscillators forces the following oscillator to take on the same pitch, give or take an octave, of the leading oscillator. And we know the quality of the output is going to depend, of course, on the waveform of the follower, but also the relative speeds of the leader and follower can make a big difference, as can the polarity of the pulses from the leader. Also, though I didn't demonstrate it here, the pulse width can really change things up. And that's a lot of variables for what we originally just saw as a simple switch to flip or a modular input. But we're not done yet, because so far I've only been talking about hard sync, and there's also soft sync in some cases. And also, God help me, this is just for one class of VCOs, the one that used the 3340 oscillator. Other oscillators implement it completely differently. I mean, here are some examples of how a bunch of different oscillators outputting sine waves respond to the same incoming sync pulse. Hell, the STO doesn't do anything, because apparently you need to have the shape control turned up for the sync to do anything. If you've seen many of my videos, you know I try to be authoritative about something to really explain how it works. But for something as innocuous as a single input labeled sync, it turns out that it is really in many cases just sort of a mystery input. We know that it's probably going to set the pitch to match the leader, 
but the actual quality of the sound that comes out, who even knows? What parameters on the input are going to have an effect? Who knows? In the end, I really need to come back to what Gordon Reed said, that sync is the least understood element of a synthesizer, and I think we now know why that is. The output can depend on so many factors that really, the only way to know how it's going to work is to try it, in a lot of different ways. It's hard to tell if this is really exciting or super frustrating. My whole view of what sound synthesis is, the manipulation of harmonic content, just got a major new tool added to the toolbox. But it's also a completely unpredictable tool, with a ton of options to explore. I feel like this one little unassuming input has exponentially opened up my options. I only have so much time in the day. I suppose there's one last thing I really need to address, and that's how the harmonic content of two pitches from the same oscillator aren't going to be the same after an oscillator is synced. Typically you have a sawtooth wave, and the harmonics of a sawtooth wave are the same regardless of the pitch. That isn't the same after things have been synced. As a quick example, I have two oscillators here on the depth for generating sawtooth waves. One's at an F, one's at an A. You can see that, as I just said, the spectrum has the same harmonic structure, the standard one we've seen earlier for sawtooth waves. Now let's sync both of those oscillators as followers against the same leader, generated here by the CEM3340. Immediately we can see the waveforms change, but they aren't the same shape. The process of syncing them has caused them to have to do different things to match the frequency of the leader. So now when we check the spectra, they aren't the same. The harmonics are different for the F that was forced up to a C than for the A that was forced up to a C. Each note has its own harmonic content when synced this way. And that raises some interesting possibilities for sequencing, and I've got one more demo for that. Here I've got the Vermona Melodicer playing through a simple sequence, and I've got it running here on the follower, not synced. And now I'm going to sync that follower, and that's going to try to force it to the C. In the meantime, the sequencer is still trying to change the underlying pitch on the follower, but we just saw that we get different harmonics when you do that. So in this case, we have the pitch fixed at C, but the harmonics are jumping around like crazy in response to the sequence. Next, I'm going to run the sequencer through just the leader. As we'd expect, the pitch of the follower is changing now to follow the leader, but underneath, the follower is still trying to stay at its originally tuned pitch. So again, we have this tension between what the oscillator wants to be set to and what the sync is telling it to do. We've still got the harmonics changing all the time, but at least it's following the sequence now. Finally, I'm going to run the sequence output into both the leader and the follower. So if the sequence sends out one volt, then both the leader and follower are going to go up by an octave. If it sends out 0.583 volts, then both the leader and the follower are going to go up by a fifth. Because the pitch relationships have remained the same, the harmonics, while not fixed, follow a much more predictable pattern and result in a different sound. So on top of everything else that can affect the timbre resulting from oscillator sync, you have to take into account the relationship between the pitches of the leader and the follower, and how they might change while being played or sequenced. Now one great thing about this technique is, with all of these crazy harmonics being generated, that gives something for a filter to chew on that can be really interesting. I'm going to have a demo at the end that shows this, but that's one more thing you have to take into account when you're looking at syncing. What is a filter going to do to it when it comes out the other side? This was a maddening video to make. Every time I learned something, I realized there was a ton more I didn't know. And at the end, after a week of working on the script, throwing it away, working on it again, throwing it away, there's a still a huge number of unanswered questions. I feel like this video is simultaneously more successful than I ever imagined, but also that I failed to really explain things. I blame Gordon Reed. So I guess that's it? Let me know what you think in the comments. Do you understand Oscillator Sync better now? Did I leave any big obvious questions unanswered? Just how big a drink do I need after all of this? As I mentioned earlier, I was actually doing this as a step before getting into frequency modulation, which I now think is going to be a way easier topic to explain, and then I want to go into FM synthesis, so watch for those in the future, and definitely leave a comment if there's any other topics you'd like to see covered. 
I'm going to finish up here with uh, just continuing the little demo I was doing there with the uh, sequencer. Uh, and I bring in some uh, reverb and I get uh, some filtering involved. So stick around for that if you want. But if you've gotten to this far and you haven't hit the like and subscribe button yet, maybe do that. Thanks for watching.